Welcome to Smithville Baptist Church with Pastor Terry Alford. People often wonder, how can I know Jesus? You find him here in the Bible. Did you know that in the Bible there are over 7,000 promises by God just for you? I want to encourage you to open this Bible and make those promises as your own. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Now let's check out today's message. Well, we're in the book of John. We actually made it to the 21st chapter of John. We just got done with Jesus and dropping in on the, on the boys in the room and seeing them and then they, he came back another time and saw Thomas and remember he said reach in here and feel my hand and feel my side put your hand in my side and stop and he says do not be unbelieving but believing and yet I'm quite convinced that Thomas never did that I think that the disciples did the first time he showed up, but I don't think the second time did Thomas do that because he was overwhelmed and overawed by the fact that he saw Jesus in front of him. So, so much to the point he said, my Lord and my God. And that was the first decree that God, that he was his God. And that, and that, was, that was awesome. And, and we all hopefully have come to that place in our life where we recognize Jesus is just not a good guy. He's not just somebody that came to earth for a little while, had some good words to say, make people feel good, to throw out a few miracles, and then he was a, a man he just took off. He's not that. He is God. And he came just for us. And that's, and that's an awesome thing. And, and Thomas learned that. I can't imagine. They probably have some history about Thomas after that, but I, I, I do not foresee any time from that point on did Thomas ever do anything about the doubting part. He knew exactly who he was serving and he never hesitated from that point on. I believe he's the one, I'm not positive of this, I, I'll ask Dale, he knows everything. But I think Thomas was the one that went to India and started the ministry and he, he was actually martyred in, in India. Yeah, so uh, just, just amazing, just astounding. Uh, if you ever wanna look up and see what the disciples did with their life after scripture, it's awesome. And everyone was martyred except for one. The guy that wrote this book. Verse 1, chapter 21 says this. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, which we know as John and James, and two of the other of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we are going with you. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know what it was, that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples were came in from the little boat, but the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, about two hundred cubits, about three hundred feet, dragging the net with fish. Then, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. And Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Great story. 
You know, if you, if, as you're reading the book of John, when you get to the end of chapter 20, you think that's the end. If you look at it, it, it actually ends like, I mean, when it says, uh, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The end. You can see that it could possibly be that way. And yet, there's chapter 21. And I find it interesting because he said, I, all these things are written so that you may believe, and yet John all of a sudden had more to write. It's almost like an addendum. It's like, oh, wait a minute, I forgot a couple things. And I think it's very important to, act, to, to uh, examine what he thought was so important that he added it on. Um, and one of them is this story where, where uh, Simon Peter and the other disciples decided to go fishing. First of all, here we have Peter again. He's a leader. And he says, I'm going to go fishing, and immediately people follow him. You, we all know people like that, don't we? There are those that uh, are leaders and those that are followers. Neither one is bigger or better than the other one, by the way. Because if everybody was a leader, you wouldn't have anybody to fo have following you. So it's good that there's leaders and followers. There's nothing wrong with it. I always think about Scott, who can sit up here and play music and sing and all that stuff. And I, I could be envious of him, but if he didn't have me who would listen to him and enjoyed it, what he could do, it would be worthless for him. Right? I mean, you've got to have both sides of it. And, and Peter is a leader. Peter said, let's go fishing. The thing of it is that people don't remember is that if you read the other Gospels, you'll find out that Jesus said, go to Galilee and wait for me. And this is where they are. They're in Galilee. And so they're by the sea, which is the Sea of Tiberias, which is the Sea of Galilee. And, this, and, he, and he, uh, Simon Peter says, oh, we're just standing around. Let's go fishing. Bored. Got nothing else going on. Well, let's go. So he did. And all the disciples that, that were there with him, they decided to go fishing. And they went all night long. And they achieved Nothing. They got no fish. None whatsoever. These are expert fishermen, by the way. And it, why would that happen like that? Well, I think there's a reason for it. Isn't it funny that when it got all done and the morning comes along and they're headed back in and they see a guy up there and he hollers out to him, hey, children, you have any food? Well, first of all, it's got to be a slap to their face because they're great fishermen, they're professionals, and they have to say, nope, didn't get any. Scott, you ever go out, Mr. Professional Bass Fisherman, do you ever go out and not get any? Happens, doesn't it? And then when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, uh, how'd you do today? You're not real happy when you have to respond, are you? And that's the, I, I'm just as convinced that these disciples were not happy about this. They had to report Failure. And nobody likes to be reporting failure. We don't like to be failures. We like to be successful. But they had to say, nope, there isn't any. And then this guy, and, and, and I think, well, let's just go on for a minute. It says, uh, cast it on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. Now, I, I am absolutely amazed that they didn't hesitate. They just went ahead and did it. And I think maybe they got to the point, well, it's not going to hurt. We got time. And we don't have anything to eat. So we might just as well do this. And so they cast it on the right side. I find it, it wouldn't have been interesting if Jesus had cast it on the left side. I like it says the right side because whatever he says is right. So there you go. Just threw that one in. What they did, and, and, and when they cast it in, they, now they're not able to draw it in because of the multitude. How can that be? They're fishermen. They know what's going on. They know all the signs of where the fish are. Obviously, they've been by this place. They're on their way back in, so they've already been by this place once. How did they miss this? Furthermore, the boat is at most eight feet wide. Why aren't they here? And why are they here? It makes no sense. The other thing is, is how does that guy on the shore know where the fish are out here? 
It's, it's, it's astounding. It's, it's just a, 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 it's actually a miracle that they're witnessing. Now, nobody's ever told me before that this is a miracle. But it is a miracle. I know Dale mentioned this morning in the men's group that, that he used to be a little bit despondent about the fact that, or discouraged about the fact that there wasn't miracles like we used to. We, we read about in scripture, but we don't see those kind of miracles. And I think he's come to the conclusion that the miracles are happening, we're just not seeing them for some whatever reason. There's miracles happening all the time. You know why? God hasn't changed. Jesus Christ has not changed. He's the same miracle working God he always has been. It's not changing. And if he doesn't change, then the only other element in the situation is us. So, therefore the disciple whom Jesus loves said to Peter, it's the Lord. And so he recognized this. And so Peter jumps in, and it's an awesome, awesome scene. He, he gets his clothes back on and jumps in. One would think today we would leave our clothes and our hand up above the water, and then we get in there, and then we put them on, but he didn't care. He threw his clothes on, headed in there. And they had to drag the fish in. And it took them a lot to do. And then when Jesus said, hey, bring some of those fish here that you've caught, and he did. It was Peter that drew them there. The fishermen had all, the rest of them had all they could do with the boat to bring them into shore. And yet Peter went out and dragged them all in, 153 of them. Now I looked up that, that just as an aside, I looked up, is there anything great about 153? If you have an hour or two and you want to go on and Google that, find out what the number for 153 stands for and all this other stuff, I have come to the conclusion that even God has a sense of humor. I don't think it means anything. They have come up with so many different thought processes on it that all of a sudden I recognize that this is just ludicrous. It just happened to be 153. Now, God could change that, and maybe there is something, but I'll tell you what. You, there's pages, pages of what that 153 means. All sorts of different things. So I just threw that out the door. I was going to come up with a, make up my own little story, but you don't need to hear that. So, so, so here we have, the guys went out fishing, and, and this all happened. And they, and they get on, to, they come and they, they, uh, they come to shore. Now, now the other thing that's interesting is, this man who they now recognize as being Jesus, has a fire going. He's already got fish on the grill. And he's also got bread on the grill. Where did they come from? Do you think he walked out in the water and found that spot and said, oh man, I, there, there was 158. I brought five of them in. There's 153 left. You can get the rest of them. I don't think so. I often think that he just whistled and the fish jumped in the frying pan. I have no idea. We don't know how it happened, but he's God. We do know that he multiplies things. He, he makes things. He takes two fishes and five loaves and, and feeds 5,000 people. It's amazing what Jesus can do. And they saw this. And they recognized him. And I, I, I find it very interesting that the disciples did not dare to ask him who he was because they knew who he was. They were awestruck. Now, they shouldn't have been surprised because Jesus showed up. It says it, this is the third time. He's already been there twice now and he just shows up. And remember the second time? He walks in and he sees Thomas, and, or steps in there and he sees Thomas and the first thing he says, hey Thomas, come on up here and check this out. Check out my hands, check out my side. And Thomas is thinking, how does he know? How does he know that? He wasn't here. But it clicked with him. And that's why Thomas says, oh, you are God. God. My Lord and my God. 
He recognized that. And that should have been prompt the disciples to remember that whether you see Jesus or you don't see Jesus does not, neither one negates the fact he's always present. He is always with them. They're learning this. And again, he's, he showed it again as he shows up. He knows what they need. They're there. They're hungry. They don't have anything to eat. He makes them breakfast. Why? Because he sees their need and he fulfills it. The simplest little thing of making breakfast. He did this. Jesus is always present. Folks, I think John wrote this in here for a particular reason. In it's that he wants you to understand that Jesus is always present in your life, in your life, in your life. He's always, always, always present. You don't have to be worried that you're all alone. How many people get that way sometimes? You think, I'm all alone. There's nobody understands me. Nobody, no, nobody understands what I'm going through. I'm all alone. Jesus is always with you. Always. Now another thing I think that John is trying to show us is that this whole venture took place without Peter and without the disciples talking to the Lord about it. See, the last thing the Lord told them is just go to Galilee and wait. Well, Peter's waited long enough. He's going to go get some action. It doesn't matter where he's going to go. And so they get in the boat. And I think it's just a quick, short little message here. But it's this. If you don't put Jesus into your plans, your plans are doomed to fail. They will never live up to the best that they could be because you did it on your own. Once you have Jesus in your life, once you know who Jesus is, if you don't submit to him, if you don't check things out with him, bring him your plans and bring him your thoughts and ask for his help and ask for his guidance and all that, you're going to fail. We're not meant to live outside of Jesus. We're not meant to. In fact, it makes me shudder to think if I ever had to have to live this life again knowing that Jesus has walked away from me. That's fear. That's real fear, knowing that. But we're not supposed to. We're supposed to include Jesus in on everything we do. And when we do that, there's peace. Because as we trust in him, he will guide us. He will lead us. And he will direct us in the way that we should go. And the results will be what they're supposed to be because you placed him in the center of your plans. Peter did not place him in the center of his plans. The fishermen just went out on their own. They didn't do what they're supposed to be doing. And yet, do you notice that Jesus doesn't beat them over the head? He doesn't discipline them. They're not being disciplined when they came here. What he's trying to say is, here I am, and I've been with you all along. Why didn't you ask me to join you when you went fishing? He would have gone. They might not have seen him. But when you acknowledge Jesus in your life, he's right there. You know that. When you're talking to him and you're praying and you trust that he's right with you, don't you know that he's there? Don't his peace come into you? That's the whole point of it. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. If you acknowledge the Holy Spirit is in us, we have peace. If we allow the Holy Spirit to become dormant in our lives because we don't acknowledge him as our Lord and Savior, if we just allow him not to be a part of our life, he comes very quiet. And with that quietness comes unrest. And if it's not, if you wait too long, it changes into fear. But when we have something, I, I, I preached about this in Plaska a few weeks ago, we have a treasure in our hearts. He's called the Holy Spirit. That's a, he's a treasure. A treasure. And if we don't acknowledge it, if we don't take part, take part with it, if we don't have, make it a part of our lives, it's a part of our lives, and if we don't share him, we don't have joy. 
I believe that treasure is where we find our joy. And uh, so I, I think right here, this is, John is just telling us, we need to put Jesus into the center of our plans. Whatever we're going to do, make sure he's there first. He doesn't care how little it may be. Pat, when you're hitting that pot for a birdie, pray. If you don't make it, have you lost anything? Not really. But what you have done is opened up a line of communication between God and yourself. Now that sounds foolish to people that don't care about golf. But I don't care if you're doing golf or if you're in the kitchen making a batch of cookies. Ask God to help you. He wants to be a, a part of everything in your life, not just bits and pieces. It meant something to Jesus when these fishermen went out and they didn't say, Jesus, come with me. It meant a lot to him. He wanted to be there. He still wants to be in your presence. He still wants to be invited in to whatever you're doing. I'd like to find out, it said bring you some fish. It doesn't say that they cleaned them, so that must have been really good. But folks, there's another aspect, and I hope you get this. There's only two things I wanted to share today, and the first one was that, to put him in your plans. Put Jesus right where he wants to be. He wants to be there. He covets to be in your presence. Isn't that amazing? We often think that we should be coveting after him, that we want everything he's got. But folks, he's done everything so that he can have a relationship with you. Everything. And all he wants you to do is invite him in. All the time. All the time. The other thing that I find is interesting, and I don't know if people catch this or not. Maybe I'm the only one. So I'm just going to share something I... I have finally figured out, or tried to figure out, and, and you bear with me, and it's, verse 7 says, Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter. Now, that's unbelievable that anybody would talk like that. John's writing about himself, you see. But he said this two other times. And, uh, at first you could almost figure that he's pretty pompous, pretty arrogant, when he describes himself as the disciple that Jesus loves. I don't find that. I used to think that, that he thought he was a little bit special, more special than the rest. But there's a lesson here. And I, and I think this is so important for each one of us to grasp this. Jesus, Pete, John says that he is the disciple that Jesus loves. Is he making a true statement? He is, isn't he? Now, conversely, he could have said, I'm the disciple that loves Jesus the most. Would that be a true statement? We don't know. We don't do that comparison, do we? But he wasn't saying it. He says, I know that I am the one that Jesus loved. I think that we need to know. Bonnie Gay, let me tell you something. I am absolutely convinced that you're the one person in this world that Jesus loves. You are. Forget about everybody out there. You are the one person that Jesus loves. Sue, so, I'm absolutely convinced that you are the one person in this world that Jesus loves. Elaine, I'm absolutely convinced that you are the one person in this world that Jesus loves. And I could go around this whole room and mention that to each one of you. I want you to understand that. Jesus loves you regardless of everything else that's going on in this world, regardless 
of every other person in this world. Jesus loves you. And folks, if you ever got a hold of that, look at what John was able to do with his life because he recognized it as a young man who Jesus was and that Jesus loves me. Which I thought was absolutely unique that we started out with a hymn, Jesus loves me. This I know. It's me. It's not us. It's me. If we find ourselves needing something in this world, it's the fact of the knowledge that Jesus loves me. It's so important to grasp that. You're not just another clump of mud in a whole barnyard of mud. You are an individual. You are special. You are your unique. And Jesus came and died on the cross just for you. Grasp that. Understand that when you're starting to face some struggles or trials or tribulations in your life. Understand that he loves you. And if he loves you, and you know anything about Jesus, you know that no matter what you come up against, he's right with you. He's baking breakfast for you right now. He's got everything you need. He's there. He will not leave you. He doesn't forsake you. He doesn't come and go with the wind. He is constant, constant, constantly in your life. We need to grasp that. There's such power and there's such life in knowing who you are. You are the one that Jesus loves. John wrote that over and over again because he knew how important it was for him to know that. More so, how important it is for each one of us to know that. Jesus loves me. And when we get to know that enough, we can face the things this world throws at us and we can get through it with a smile on our face and a, step, a, a light step as we walk along because we know where that love is, that perfect love that he gives us. There is no fear. For perfect love casts out all fear. See, we love him because he first loved us. We are to love one another because he first loved us. And when we look at each other, the one thing you have to remember, Christians, Jesus loves the person beside you just as much as he loves you. You haven't got the right to love somebody more than somebody else. Jesus is our example. He loves each one of us with every, everything in his body, his whole life, everything. Everything that Jesus is, is love. That's why John writes, God is love. And we got to understand that love is ours. And it's also our neighbors. And that's why it says to love your neighbor as yourself because you're, he's in the same situation you're in. And it's a wonderful thing. And it will stop the rifts and the struggles that people have amongst themselves when they recognize that you are on, are on equal floor, on equal platform, on equal level, whatever it might be. You are no different. You are no better. You are no worse. Jesus loves you with all of his being, but he loves your neighbor the same way. 
So let's get a hold of that. Let's grasp that knowledge that, that John writes in here that I think is so unique when he says, I am the disciple that Jesus loved. And, and I recommend maybe going home and using the mirror and stand in front of it and look in the mirror and say, Jesus loves me. This I know. See what that does for you today. Amen. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord God, that when we open your word, it is full of life. It is full of love. It is full of grace. It is full of mercy. It is full of wonderful, wonderful things that you've promised to your people. And God, I lift up this congregation today, Lord, and I know that you know each one of us intimately. And I pray, Lord God, that as they would go through this day and, and through this week, coming week, Lord God, that they would recognize their position in your kingdom, that they are the disciple that Jesus loves. Let us walk in that love. Let us walk in that knowledge. Let us walk in this love. Sharing that. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. the pain out Father wash it all away Follow me Holy Spirit take my heart lead me every day